accomplished women in science um, at the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. My name is Kirsten Sadler Edipli, and I'm a scientist, a biologist, and a standing member of the faculty here at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, I'm thrilled to see that so many of you are here tonight um, and are excited about celebrating the innovation and about celebrating the success of women um, in the overarching field of science. As a scientist and a professor, I love questions. So let's start with a few. So question number one, why are we hosting a lecture series dedicated specifically to women in science? Well, because half of the global population are women, and meaning this means that half of all ideas, half of all inspired insight, half of all the excitement, drive, and creativity about how the world functions comes from females. However, women make up less than a quarter of the global workforce in science, technology, engineering, and math, or as we like to call it, STEM. Um, and women make up about 30% of all the faculty in science worldwide. It's less than 20% of all engineers, whether in academia or practicing. Um, this difference in the gender distribution across STEM fields is called the STEM gender gap. We aim to close this gap right here in Abu Dhabi. Indeed, we're on our way. Our graduates in STEM fields are achieving, are approaching gender equity. And um, with this, their diversity in ideas and solutions and discoveries are fresh, inspired, and transformed. Okay, my second question. Um, does anybody know why April 4th, 2017 is a prime day to launch the series? Any ideas? Um, well, today is Equal Pay Day in America. Does anybody know what Equal Pay Day is? So Equal Pay Day is the day that symbolizes how far into the year a woman must work to earn what men earned in the previous year doing the same job. So in the US, women earn 72 cents for every dollar that a man earns. And equal pay day here in the UAE comes a little later in the year because women earn 64 cents on the dollar um, and every dollar earned by a man. So this is called the wage gap. Um, and not a single country in the world has come close to closing this wage gap in 2016. It's my hope that my daughter, indeed all of our sons and daughters, will only think of the word gap as a place to buy jeans or sweatshirts and not as, think about it as how it will affect her career, her choices, or her earning power. So today we're addressing both the STEM gender gap while we're mindful of the wage gap. So question number three, how do we close these gaps? and capitalize on the brain power that is being marginalized, lost by marginalization of women in STEM. One way is to encourage um, young girls and young women to pursue degrees in STEM. Another way is to encourage women already in STEM to stay in STEM and to keep them engaged in the discoveries that they are already making. So this sounds straightforward, but it's not easy. So um, what's not so easy about closing the STEM wage gap? Well, I'll turn back to Amelia Earhart, who was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic in, in 1928. And her, one of her most famous quotes is that women, like men, should try to do the impossible. And when they fail, their failure should be a challenge to others. However, the success of women in science has not been fully recognized, and their failures in science are often not seen as a challenge to in, uh, or inspiration, but instead as an impediment for other women looking to pursue a, a, a career in STEM, in STEM. We can change that. We can follow Ms. Earhart's suggestion um, to turn any failure to do the impossible into a challenge to rise up. We can rise to this challenge by celebrating successes of women scientists, showing how time and time again, women have talent, creativity, and passion to accomplish what needs to be done in science, technology, and engineering. That women's work in these, and indeed all fields, is just as valuable as a man's. So examples of this success are among the most powerful means to inspire and achieve change. In this series, we will provide example after example of the amazing successes of women in science. And by science, we mean this in the broadest term. It's data, it's discovery-driven, it's inquiry and innovation. 
Women and men have made and are making incredible progress in these areas. However, it is well documented from news outlets to Wikipedia to prestigious award committees that women scientists are not recognized, celebrated, or given credit for their accomplishments in equality to their male uh, colleagues. We here in this series at NYU Abu Dhabi and as a community here applaud the accomplishments of great women scientists. Here in this series, we have the good fortune to hear from a few such women. Tonight, we launched the series with Ms. Leila Ali Saif bin Harab Al Muhari, an innovator and leader who exemplifies how a strong vision, solid foundation, and data and strategy can change an industry, one that is globally male dom dominated. 90 years after Amelia Earhart made her landmark flight, the gender gap in aviation is so stark it makes science look like an equal opportunity field. Less than 5% of all pilots worldwide are women, and less than 2% um, of flight mechanics are women. Impressively, under Ms. Harab's watch, Etihad and Emirates alone have, hi have hired over 100 women pilots. So I'll do the math for you. That means that 2.5% 2 2 of all women pilots in the world are in the UAE. Now a bit about Ms. Harab. She was born in Dubai, and originally she says she's from the mountains in Ras al-Khaimah. She attended UAE University, and where she majored in computer engineering, so she is truly one of us in the STEM field. She's completing uh, her MBA at Coventry University um, in its uh, associated program with the Emirates Avi Aviation University. Um, before joining the UAE's um, General Aviation Aviation Authority, she worked for four years at the Rhodes and Transport Authority, where she pioneered a strategic plan for this organization, established the framework for the authority's governance, and established an award-winning call center. In 2009, she started at the UAE General Civil Aviation Authority, where she's been in charge of strategic planning. She served as executive director for aviation strategies and international affairs, and is the current assistant director general. And she'll tell you a little bit about this work tonight. She's an acclaimed in global business and in aviation sectors. She's had many, many awards. A few of them um, include du the Dubai's Best Professional Aviation Woman, Woman Leadership Congress Award. She's a two-time winner of the UAE Aviation Award, and impressively, a 2013 um, Stevie Award, which recognizes women from across the globe, and she was given that award for Female Innovator of the Year for a government agency. So Ms. Harab tonight embodies what we aim to showcase, that data-driven, high-performance industries like aviation can be expertly led by smart and competent women. I welcome Ms. Harab to NYU Abu Dhabi, and we'll end with a quote from Amelia Earhart. It's a quote she gave when she was um, celebrated with a ticker tape parade in New York City after she returned from her landmark flight. And President Her Herbert Hoover awarded her a medal for her contributions to aviation. She accepted this medal on behalf of all women and said, my ambition is to have this wonderful gift produce practical results for the future of commercial flying and for the women who may want to fly tomorrow's planes. I think Ms. Earhart would be pleased to say to see how Ms. Hareb is fulfilling this ambition. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the lovely introduction. I wrote some comments on your introduction, by the way. <laughs> uh, Christine, um, when I saw her in IATA, uh, I think it's the Innovation uh, Summit of IATA, IATA is the International Association of the Airlines last year. And when she invited me, I was very thrilled to come. It's, it's my first time to come to New York University over here, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, she talked about the gender gap, and I could see the gender gap actually in the audience here. I, I can see five women, six, <laughs> okay, seven, <laughs> eight. So you can see uh, the gender gap in STEM, even in the audiences here. And we do have a, a serious issue in the gender gap in UAE. I think it's, it's a global issue. It's not only uh, a United Arab Emirates issue. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here, to really encourage uh, women to work in uh, fields of STEM like aviation. 
it might be intimidating in the beginning, aviation, which I will tell you a little bit about it later on. But it's very inst it's, uh, interesting. It's very uh, rewarding uh, for women. There's a lot of opportunities. And if I can give you the statistics before I, talk, uh, uh, before I talk about myself, 2% of UAE aviation is nationals. Less than 10% of the 2% is female. So you can understand the opportunities, the vast opportunities for women in aviation in the UAE. Let me talk about myself. I think Christine gave a little bit of an uh, introduction about myself. I am a computer engineer. Uh, I studied in the United Arab Emirates University, 89. Don't ask about my age, please. Okay, 89. I went into uh, UAE University, studied uh, computer engineering, and I uh, worked in the infrastructure and transport fields all my life. 25 years I work in a, with the government of UAE to help build a better infrastructure and transport systems uh, for, for the public of UAE. 12 years I worked in Dubai Electricity and Water Authority as head of uh, uh, information technology. And then I decided to move out from, from IT and go to a more strategic role where I joined RTA, the Roads and Transport Authority, to when, when it was in the phase of establishment. So uh, the decree of establishment of uh, RTA came end of 2005. I joined immediately in, uh, in the beginning of 2006 we started setting up where we were six people in RTA and we had set up uh, RTA and you can see the achievements of RTA and all the metros, all the infrastructure, all the roads and the bridges and the public transportation systems. After five years, it was, it was established. And that was one of my proud moments actually in uh, supporting the uh, UAE and especially Dubai government uh, vision. I went out of RTA and I stumbled across aviation. I'm not an aviator, but I stumbled across aviation five, five months after uh, going out of RTA. Somebody invited me to come uh, and head the strategic planning of GCAA. And it was, it was a golden opportunity for me. I hesitated in the beginning because I have no clue about aviation. I was working in uh, Rosen Transport Authority and before the US. So aviation was a, a, new, uh, a new territory for me, which, I, which I, never, I really never knew what is the aviation framework in UAE. I'm just a passenger. I go as a tourist. I take flights and I go and take my kids and travel. That's it. I don't know anything about the infrastructure of aviation. That was a big challenge for me, and for me to join GCAA at that moment, GCAA was going through a whole uh, restructuring uh, phase where all the management, uh, director general, assistant director generals, directors left the GCAA without any management, and it was ranked one ranked actually like six, 60, uh, uh, 60 rank above uh, uh, between all the countries in uh, IQ ranking. In five years, in five years joining, after joining GCAA, GCAA became number one in aviation safety and aviation security in the IQ ranking and in, in also the ranking of uh, the UAE federal government where they, where, they have the, uh, where they have the Sheikh Khalifa Award for Excellence and we ranked number one, number one strategic planning and number, number one and the most improved uh, organization and performance. So in five years, uh, while after joining GCAA, we have seen tremendous, uh, tremendous achievements. And um, talking about Emilia Earhart, I'm so, I'm, I'm so proud to be one of the 70s, uh, 70 women uh, with Emilia Earhart on a, on a big, uh, on a big, uh, uh, wall on an IQ that recognized from the beginning of aviation as the most most uh, inspiring uh, uh, aviation woman for for generations. That's that's my biggest biggest achievement ever. So this is about me. I'll talk about a little bit about aviation. Uh, I structured my presentation about aviation in the beginning, and then I will talk about innovation, and then I will talk about innovation in aviation. So uh, with the theme STEM, we, you have to talk about innovation, right? You need to understand how does uh, your knowledge of STEM and, your, uh, and the knowledge of innovation really help 
support the growth uh, the growth of aviation now what is air transport do you really know what is what is the framework or the the over overall picture of uh, air transport systems does anybody really work like that <laughs> Yes, so it's a more complex system that we see. We see, a, we see an airport and we uh, fly on a plane and then that's it. You see the customs, you go through the customs and then that's it. That's the passenger experience. But that's a seamless experience. When you, take, when you take a bus, it is very domestic. When you take a train, it is a bit connected state to state, but still it is domestic. Aviation is a global system. And when you have a global system, and standard regulation and standard policies and practices, that becomes a more complex system because you need the whole world to agree on a certain regulation. You need a whole world to agree on the way that, this, uh, that the aviation system uh, is, uh, is growing and is, is managed. But why, why is it aviation or air transport really drives the economic growth? Dubai, for example, let me take an example of Dubai since I work in Dubai. Dubai, 45% of the GDP is contributed from aviation. So aviation is really uh, the number one driver for economic growth. If you are connected as a city, if you are connected as a country, that will drive uh, your economy. If you are not connected, then you will be disconnected from other economies and that will not help your economy grow. So economic growth is very uh, important and the aviation drives that. And when you have economic, economic growth, then you will have social growth as well. It connects people, cultures, as well, if you are a tourist and you have a flight to Sao Paulo, if you have, then, then it, it is easier for you to go connect to Latin America. It is easier for you to connect to a culture where you have that air connectivity. It allows b local businesses as well to tap into uh, global markets, which again enhance uh, the economy, generates, uh, generates trade and tourism, and it develops, it develops relationships between nations. So there's a lot of benefits of, of air transport. But what is air transport? What are we talking about? It's not only an airline. Airlines are a very important piece of the air transport. But there are different components. You have the airports and you have the air navigation <coughs> systems. These people are, if you heard about the uh, accident, the fatal accident in the States lately where the air, air, an air navigation uh, operator Directed to uh, directed an aircraft to a closed airfield, and when it directed the aircraft to a closed airfield, airfield the plane crashed and people died. So air navigation uh, system is is very important uh, component of the aviation systems, and it's not only the airline air navigations and airports. There are the regulators. General Civil Aviation Authority is a regulator. ICAO is a regulator, and we'll talk about it later. And then you'll have the whole supply chain, people who are painting the aircraft, maintaining the aircraft, bringing food, making the plastic cups that you see in the small toilets of the aircraft. So there's a whole supply chain in aviation, which is, which is very important to make, uh, make aviation a sustainable, sustainable system. Now, who is the most important body in aviation is the International Civil Aviation Organization. This organization was formed in the 40s after, after the war, and they decided that states comes together and they have signed, a number of states have signed Chicago Convention. Chicago Convention, group of states sat there on a table in Chicago and, defi and defined the, the initial regulations on which aviation sh safety should be, aviation security should be, how ANS is managed, air navigation systems are managed, and how the environment is going to be protected, and how do we negotiate air service agreement, or how the economic relation in aviation is going to be shaped. So that's IQ, and it was formed in the 40s. Still, it is the most active and efficient body of the United Nations. It's a body in the United Nations. And we are, very, we, we are prou proudly saying that we are a member of the, uh, of the Council as UAE. We are a member of the dec decision makers of the 35 countries around the world who are decision makers in setting up the policies and the laws and the regulations and, uh, ahead in future. 
IATA is the International Aviation uh, or Air, Air Transport Association, where it's an association of all airlines where they come together and protect the interest of, uh, of the uh, airlines. They also look at what kind of centralized products that the airlines would want, especially looking at IT, for example, the connectivity of the airlines, the booking systems, things like uh, these systems which, which connects airlines together. IATA has uh, formed an, a company called CETA, in order to develop all the systems for the airlines and to standardize and harmonize all the systems used by, by the airlines. It's a very important body which lobby a lot in IQ for the interest of the airlines. Kanzu is similar to IATA, which is all, all the ANS or air navigation systems uh, come together and uh, create a lobby uh, organization to lobby for, uh, for ANS. Uh, and then the civil aviation authorities in every country, in every state, which is one, 193 states that signed Chicago Convention and part of IQ, they have to have an autonomous civil aviation authority, a civil aviation authority which forms or which develops and enforces, which uh, regulates and oversee, oversee the implementation of the regulation of aviation safety and security. Um, I talked about innovation, uh, economic benefits. I wouldn't, I can't see even the numbers here. You can see it be, be, maybe better. There's a lot of economic uh, benefits of aviation. Uh, on tour, you can see a lot of impacts on tourism and you can see a lot of uh, impact on, uh, on businesses as well. You will have this presentation for you. Now, talking about aviation, I think I will not talk about this slide until I talk about innovation later on, but there are a lot of innovation barriers in aviation. And they put this slide on just before talking about air transport agreements. Why? Because this is my field. Uh, what I do is I, I lead the negotiation for, uh, for UAE with other states. So if an airline, for example, Emirates Airline wants to go to Canada, okay? So they want to go to Canada, but they don't have enough routes legally signed, signed with the Canadian side. So as a government, I go and I sit with the Canadian side and I negotiate, negotiate these routes. Okay, we want to... Op we want to uh, <laughs> Uh, fly to Montreal, fly to Toronto, fly to Ottawa. And then we start negotiating. That's a government to government. That's not an operational thing for the airlines. And I think people get confused sometimes if, you, if an airline opens to a country that it, 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 is an, it is a commercial agreement. That's not a commercial agreement. The air transport is ruled by the bilaterals, by bilateral legal agreements between state to state. And this is what I do. And this is what is the least field of innovation you can, you can see because this is a very political decision between state to state. So for, for us to go and start implementing innovative methods in order how to smoothen, how to improve air transport bilateral systems, it's extremely hard, but I could see it. I could see it in 10 years coming. I will explain later on why I'm saying this. Now, Okay, let me give you this slide. It's a very interesting slide. Have you heard about the freedom of the skies? Who heard about the freedom? Okay. All right, so I can ask you questions. <laughs> no? <laughs> there, are different, there are nine freedom of the skies. Currently, most people do the first and second. Okay, and third and fourth is something that we always negotiate with countries. It's very hard to get, but we do have a lot of air transport agreements with the third and fourth. Fifth is the, if you talk about fifth, people will close doors in front of you. They don't want fifth. <laughs> and then six, seven, eight, nine, which is really, it's very, it's uh, unknown territory and we don't have any agreements and such. So what is first and until nine? So first is, if, if an, a carrier will take passenger from a country to another. The second is, is a carrier taking, uh, taking passengers from a different country to the original country. Okay, that's first and second. So it is really one way, one way movement and the second movement. What is third and fourth? It is moving 
moving passengers without any uh, any frequency uh, frequency limitation. So you can move passengers from this country to other country, and then you can take passengers from that country to an, to this to your country, but without any limitations on you can take you can have a seat no seat capacity. You don't have any limitations on which which state which uh, city to city. So it's it's your, the country is open for any any point. They can they can operate third and fourth. That's third and fourth, and that's that, that's a bit of open uh, open arrangements. What is fifth? Fifth is a more difficult one. You go, I go to. Have you seen? Have you heard about the problem of UAE, Milan, New York? Okay, only three of you, yeah? So that's the whole situation where we are lobbying. Now, where I, when I go to the States, I negotiate, but they, they, they don't come here usually. But we, <laughs> so we, we negotiate because that is something that they think we are stealing passengers from a different market. How? Let me explain. Emirates go to Milan, and then they pick up passengers from Milan to New York. So Milan to New York... As, as the Americans say, how many Americans are here? <laughs> okay, that's, an, that's a European uh, USA market. And a, uh, a UAE carrier should not compete on that market. Okay, that's not an open market. It's still protectionism, it's still protecting markets. Okay, so that's that's the fifth freedom. So really, the lobbying of the uh, the American airlines, lobbying of the European airlines, they are not talking about the third and fourth freedom. They are talking about the fifth freedom. Don't come here, take our passengers, and transport them somewhere else. Okay, that's the whole uh, debate between us and the and the EU and the and the states. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm telling you, it's a new territory that I ha I have never discussed. A six freedom or seven freedom. I have never discussed that, so you don't need to complicate your life about that. That is that is something. If somebody here were uh, studying economics, this is something which is great for uh, innovation. How to innovate the arrangements of air transport and aviation. That's a huge, uh, you know, a huge opportunity for innovation. But still, do we, do we see innovation there? No, it's really political will and political desires that is driving the uh, economic, uh, you know, arrangements between state to state. And I, I always talk about this and I call scholars. I, call, I talk about it in every university, come up and give us solutions for, this, for, for these arrangements. It's very important. And if we can change this, and then we are we are going to move into a more competitive, a free a free uh, a free market for aviation. Right now, there's a lot of countries who use who use these arrangements in order to protect their own carriers. UAE uses an open sky arrangement, so we are we always go for every negotiation with an open sky. We sit down and we say. Come to our country, whatever route you, whatever city you want, whatever capacity, whatever aircraft you uh, you have, even 380s. Bring your 380s here. So dump dump into our market. We are okay with it because we we are looking at it from a global from a from a bigger picture that every passenger comes, they will increase, they will participate in the economy, they will participate in the in the GDP. But that is not the thinking with some uh, other uh, states. They think if they protect their national carrier, you know, they will protect their economy, but they need a bigger picture than that. Now, there are a lot of challenges. Other than this, other than air transport arrangements, there are a lot of other challenges uh, in, uh, in uh, innovation aviation. There is a lot of wars, and you can see the, you can see the political, uh, political uh, you know, uh, map right now. It's, there's a lot of conflicts everywhere, and every conflict uh, affects aviation. There are uni unions. We, are not, we, are, we don't have unions in the UAE, and that's... For us, it's a blessing because it's it's a way to manage the airlines better. But in Europe, they are they're suffering with the unions, and they need a different arrangement, different social arrangements uh, than unions because unions they affect the safety, they affect the security. If an air service navigation shut down because of the union demands, 
how would you protect the, the aircrafts in the sky? You cannot protect the aircrafts in the sky. The, you know, aviation will stop. So you need to look at unions. Uh, Europe needs to look at unions. Uh, North America, they need to look at unions and figure out a different way. Uh, we are not against unions as a country, but look at, look at other way in order to protect the labor rights, in order to protect the workers, other, other arrangements like the con you know, in, in contracts or anything else. So that's a challenge in, in aviation. Unemployment as well is a big challenge in aviation, loss of income, terrorism. I mean, we can see the ban, the U.S. ban. I was asked uh, by Kristen uh, earlier about the U.S. ban, and that's a challenge for, uh, for uh, aviation. Um, if anybody interested in the U.S. ban, I can talk about it later. If nobody's interested. You don't want to work on a flight to the U.S., that's fine. That's, uh, that's assuring, really. <laughs> Other barriers, infrastructure. If you have a 380, you have a, we have a, a, a big fleet of 380 for MRC airline, for example. And if you are going to a country where there's no infrastructure to accommodate 380, then you will, you will not really be able to, to move your asset and to operate your asset efficiently because the infrastructure is not there. And infrastructure in aviation is really struggling in so many countries. Infrastructure needs a lot of, a lot of capitals, a lot of funds. Okay, and they're still talking about fair competition and then the infrastructure should be funded privately. But look at UAE, infrastructure are funded, uh, funded by the government and it's working, the, uh, it is working, the system is working. So why not really fund it by the government or fund it by other means of funds? But infrastructure is a very, very crucial for aviation development in every country. There's a lot of increase of you know, the environment uh, demands, you can, you, can uh, you know, you, you heard about the ETS of the, uh, of the European uh, Union, and you can hear a lot of demands from different countries that there is a lot of environment impact on aviation, and how do we, how do we minimize that impact? And some people will create a, a, an economic policy, like the EU, we'll, we'll put taxes, we'll put taxes. Some people go for taxes immediately as is the golden, golden fix for everything. But really, you know, when you, put, when you put money on, and when you put taxes, you are really affecting, the, affecting uh, aviation economically. And you can, you can really work together without, without taxes. I'm not saying taxes, I mean, UAE is putting taxes in 2018. I'm not against that. I don't know how that will impact our economy. But taxes is very, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's the last step, let me say, the last step that you can take for, uh, for uh, affecting, affecting environment uh, or minimizing environment impact. There is the airspace congestion. Who, who have not been in an airplane and roaming 20 minutes in Dubai airport? Everybody's never heard about that or never experienced that. Airspace congestion is one of the one of the most important challenges in in, uh, in not only in UAE but in the world. In the world, planes are moving. If you can see, uh, I want you to see. If you if you have time, go to go on YouTube and uh, go and see uh, airplanes movements on globally. At live, at the uh, you know immediately you'll see you'll see how many planes roaming across uh, across the you know across the globe, and you'll see how mu how much is the airspace congested. But the congestion brings a lot of security issues, sorry safety issues. So if you are congested, then you need a proper ANS uh, management system, which which eliminates the. Uh, the the uh, what do you call it? near 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 hit between between the planes in the sky, so uh, it is one of the biggest challenges actually, and it is one of the biggest opportunities for innovation and for scholars uh, in STEM as well. If they are looking at uh, air navigation systems and trying to create more efficient systems, uh, that would be that would be great. Environment issues I talked about, traveler demand expectations. I mean. We demand that now we're like, oh, we didn't get it. Now we need this, we need that. We are with the iPhones, with the, with the technology, with, the, with all the social media. We are always demanding. Well, we, we want it to be easy, right? So we want the travel to be, to be easy. Expectations of passengers are growing and growing and growing. And that 
puts a lot of toll on uh, aviation development. Uh, external relations, as I said, we're, we, I negotiate with a lot of states, so that creates a lot of uh, lobbying uh, efforts and uh, you know, cooperation efforts between state to state, heavy economic regulation, and I talked about that earlier. So there's a, there is a lot of barriers uh, for aviation development and barriers in innovation. I will talk about innovation later, but I don't know if you are interested to know about what does my organization do. I will talk a little bit about this organization. Um, this is a federal, the G General Civil Aviation Authority is a federal entity, uh, reports to the cabinet. It's an autonomous, uh, autonomous entity. We do not uh, take any funds from the government. Our funds is totally from our fees. Our fees comes from the uh, from the licensing of uh, aircrafts, licensing of airports. Our fees comes also from the uh, flight movements. Every flight movement we charge based uh, uh, formulas based on the the size of the aircraft and the uh, and the uh, and and per kilometer or mile or. Anyway, the space that they are uh, they are using from our space. Um, administratively, as well, we are totally autonomous, so we do not report to Ministry of Finance. We do not report to uh, other uh, like uh, human resources. It's every uh, we are autonomous totally in our uh, in our policies and our uh, structures. Uh, we have a board of director. Our uh, Chairman of the board is the Minister of Economy, and uh, headed by a Director General. And we are a member of the Council, and we are a member of the ACAC, Arab Civil Aviation Authority, and we are a member also of the uh, GCC uh, GCC uh, Aviation uh, Committee, and we have different offices in Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi Two, and in Dubai One. Now, what these are these are our roles. As I said, we have. Our main role is aviation safety. So we regulate and oversee aviation safety. In aviation safety, we look at the worthiness of the aircraft. We look at the operation of uh, an airline. We license airline. We license individual cabin crews, license all from, uh, from GCAA. We look as well at, uh, at aviation security. So we license people who uh, ship dangerous goods and so on. We really inspect the airdrome and we make sure that the, the security of an, of an airport is adhering to the regulation that we are developing. Also, we manage the air, uh, the air navigation system. And then it comes to my sector, we, ha we negotiate air transport agreements. And my sector is, uh, I'll move to safety security because I need to talk about myself a little bit here. <laughs> So uh, this, is what, this is what my sector does, actually. Uh, air transport, all agreements of uh, air transport we negotiate and we sign on behalf of the federal government. Uh, we look at the environment studies as well and we, how, how do we lobby, how do we uh, put the regulations and how do we adhere to the state action plans of IQ as well. We, uh, we have an aviation safety policy across, uh, across the UAE. We also do a lot of economic studies. How, uh, how is the impact of uh, penetration into a market that will help our airlines and so on? What's the aviation impact on UAE, uh, UAE economy and, and these kind of uh, economic studies? I have the rest of uh, corporate development. We do incubate a lot of projects and we have the innovation center. We just established innovation center in GCAA and um, Maybe I can take this opportunity to open open the uh, door for anybody who can participate in the Air, Air Innovation Award, which we are going, which we really opened. I don't know if we talked to your, your university yet, but uh, it's a, it's an open door. There's a million million dirham of uh, of a prize for any innovative. Uh, concept that can be implemented in the aviation industry. You can go into Air Innovation uh, website and you can read about what innovations uh, in aviation, what kind of earlier uh, innovative ideas that we have rewarded, and you can see a lot of information about innovation in aviation. We uh, have the project management office as well. So we have done a lot of projects from the start of GCAA. If you heard about the API, have you? Have you heard about API? Nobody reads his ticket. 
Nobody reads the fine print. <laughs> if you read the fine print on your ticket, you will find that you are really uh, waiving your rights and your reservation rights to the government. But nobody is reading the, the ticket. So advanced passenger information is uh, you are a system, an integrated system as an artificial intelligence and a security intelligence that allow governments to capture your reservation data, your personal data, even the people who reserved in your credit card or whatsoever, and then uh, the, the history of your reservation, <laughs> the history of your uh, uh, movement, and it captured that and create an intelligent database where we address the threats on security. You waive that every time you purchase a ticket, you agree on sharing that kind of information with the government. You have the new information for you, right? <laughs> so only a few countries in, in, the, in the world have implemented that uh, kind of system. The States, of course, and the uh, Italy, uh, UK, uh, Australia, and South, uh, South Africa. South Africa created, why South Africa? Because when they had the, the games, is it football? Is it uh, you see? I'm not into sports. <laughs> yeah, they had to, because there's a lot of people coming from different kind of uh, countries. They had to have an advanced passenger information system uh, to order in order to address the security threats coming to the coming to the country, and that was one of the projects that we incubated in GCAA, and now it is run by uh, by the. Uh, what is Manafid? You can help me with Manafid. <laughs> it is the ports, it is the borders, borders control, borders air and sea and, uh, and land. It's a new authority actually, which is launched just now in last year. So these are the kind of projects. And we have incubated a lot of projects as well in GCAA and uh, established it and moved it to, uh, to their owners. Now, I don't know about the time. Are we okay with the time? It's what? still five minutes? I still have 60 slides. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. So I'll, I'll, move to, I'll move from innovation. I think a lot of people maybe by now with a lot of innovation uh, uh, awareness happening in the country, you will know what is innovation, why do we need an innovation uh, framework, uh, an institutionalized framework within the organization to help your strategic planning and to help your, uh, you know, to, to uh, really develop, develop your business, try to compete with the, with the entrance or with the disruptive innovation coming from the below the market uh, entrance. This I will leave for you, I'll continue to speak about aviation. Anybody wants this uh, presentation, I can send it to you. I think, I think Christine can send it to you. Now, uh, what is innovation in aviation? And why do we need uh, innovation in aviation? Of course, of course, the intranet of, intranet of things has really disruptive the aviation uh, and how it, is, uh, how it is operated. You have sharing economy. You have local consumer online services coming into place, OK? Uh, you have uh, these ecosystems, these ecosystems which innovation brought, they have reduced the barriers of entry, right? And you have a lot of barriers of entry in aviation. They have improved productivity, the intranet of things and whatever I mentioned before. They have reached new customers, new customer base which, which aviation never reached before. They have introduced products, services, and redefined, seriously, they have redefined the competitive advantage. Like the low-cost carrier, like uh, Fly, uh, Fly Dubai, uh, they, are, uh, they are new entrants, and they have disrupted the legacy carriers like airline and Tahad. So you do have a lot of uh, effects on uh, aviation coming from disruptive innovation. Um, ownership and control. Ownership and control is something which is very important in aviation, and, and the ownership of control and the intranet, intranet of things is really reshaping ownership and control. Ownership and control regulation is very, very important in aviation. And when we talk about ownership and control, why in aviation it is very important, it goes, to, it goes to the security sense of every country. They need to have ownership and control of their airline carriers. If, if you have a war, for example, and you are dependent on others to connect you to other countries, you will, you will be uh, in trouble if you don't have your own national carriers. 
Okay, and that's a feeling, but uh, and it should it should change. It, should, it really should change. There is the uh, cross-border JVs. Now you have JVs uh, cross-border from different different states. Online sales, consumer <laughs> empowerment. Now the passenger is more important. Than what they say or what how their behavior is really affecting aviation. And you have different factors of disruption, which led to a lot of changes in the airline. Now low-cost carriers is the new is a new model of uh, of airlines. You have airline mergers. You have Etihad bought, uh, not bought, Etihad, uh, <laughs> Etihad with uh, Alitalia, Etihad with Air Berlin. So you see a lot of mergers. You see a lot of organic, uh, organic, uh, you know, development of the of the airlines. You see different. You see the alliances. You see a lot of a new business models in the airlines which we didn't see before. And you see the retail controlled by third party. You see, uh, especially in aviation. Airports are become, are moving from only a, only a, f a facility for airlines for people to move. It's becoming more retail and uh, uh, more retail uh, shape. So there's a lot of factors in aviation that will change uh, aviation. I'm aware of time, so I, I will not talk about the GII, which is the Global Innovation Index. But let me get, just give you an example of how, it, since we have five minutes left, let me give you just how you will see aviation in the future. And uh, have you looked at Airbus innovation, for example? You will, you will look at future ener energy sources. This is very, very important for, for Airbus. Environment is very important. So they are looking at sustainable, fu sustainable aviation fuel. They are looking at the solar power. They are looking at fuel cells, energy harvesting, and they are trying to look at other other way of uh, getting the fuel other than the normal uh, what's that yes yeah we can do we can do that i don't know how but we can <laughs> so that's that's something which is very important looking at fuel low uh, transport congestion they are really working on a single sky single sky is by far uh, the the most important thing in aviation we really need a single sky but is it innovation? Is it a technical issue or is it a political issue? I can say, not an official statement, it's a political issue. It's not a, the systems are there, the technology is there, people are really investing in technology, but it is a political, a political issue. We need to take a political uh, decision to unify the sky. And, and look at the other one. Do you see the other picture, formation flying? Do you, it reminds you of the birds, right? But Airbus is really looking at the formation in order to have less effect on uh, on the environment and for smoothen the aircraft movements. They are looking at the at the birds and how they have the formation. Have you seen the 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 birds forming in the sky? And this is a true uh, scientific fact that it will smoothen and less. It will have less eco, less. Uh, uh, less environmental impact and more efficiency in the flying experience. And they are really looking at that concept and how they are, they are going to apply it in future. The concept plane. Okay, look at the concept. They are looking at the, looking at so many uh, different natural, uh, natural, uh, you know, uh, behaviors like the lotus effect eagle inspired winglets and they are looking at what the nature would would give us and we can apply it in, uh, in uh, you know in, in the design of an aircraft a butterfly wing a shark skin the shark skin they are going to change the aircraft uh, skin to a shark skin which will make the uh, flying more smoother so they are looking at this and they are trying to come up with innovative ways this is interesting you will not see an airport as a big airport that you need to drive through. You will see those AirPods, they call it. It's a, yeah, the AirPods. This is an AirPod, aircraft pod. Okay, you, the aircraft will go, the passengers will go out from a train station, for example. There's no airport. That's the new airport in the future. It's called an aircraft pod. You won't have airports. You won't have that kind of experience that you need to go in lane uh, in so so long and customs and and, and getting your uh, your bag. This is the future for uh, for the airports. You have the cruising the sky. We, they are moving uh, as well. They are looking into 
how do we look at aviation not as transportation, like a cruise in the sea. You don't take a cruise to move from A to B. You take a cruise because you want to enjoy the cruise process. It's not about moving from A to B. They are looking at flying. How do we, call, how do we make it a cruising in the sky experience? So this is one of the concepts that they are working on. We put casinos in planes, we'll make swimming pools. It's true, it's true, it's coming, it's happening. This is the future of the sky. This is the future of tourism in the sky. Aircraft carriers, uh, like a Star Wars, but it's happening. So the aircrafts, you'll have, you won't have air, uh, airports, you will have aircraft carriers, so you can move point to point through aircraft carriers. Not necessarily you need to land on, on, you know, you need to land somewhere. No, you will have aircraft carriers in future. So there's a lot of, a lot of innovation in, uh, happening. Not only this, are, these are ideas from Airbus only. I bet Boeing is doing a lot and competing with Airbus. The, both of them competition drives innovation actually. So I, I'm sure Boeing is trying to. Uh, uh, keep up with the, with this innovation, maybe maybe more. I just gave you an Airbus. Uh, I hope there's no French guys here. No. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So you are proud, right, with the French innovation? No, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So how how the how these uh, ideas came uh, into Airbus? They have institutionalized their innovation process. They have a proper framework of innovation where they put a framework, they put a process, and they try to harvest not only uh, not only from their own community, but they were doing crowd, uh, what do you call it, crowd innovation and, and things like this. They, they are trying to harvest those ideas from within Airbus and from the public as well. They have a business lab, biz lab they call it, so they bring uh, startups and they try to help them if they, are, uh, if they can uh, develop their ideas and it will help Airbus. They have Fly Your Ideas, uh, uh, Fly Your Ideas uh, channel, and they have different channels as well. So there's, um, I think I'm aware of time, but my presentation is very long. Um, not only in manufacturing, we, uh, in aviation requires innovation, but also there's a lot of things. The travel, the travel experience as well, it requires a lot of innovation. And, and what does IATA do is, is really looking at, at the traveler. If you can see, if you can see this uh, journey, uh, there's citizens, there are passengers, uh, there, the, there are borders, okay, there are face recognition systems, border control system, checking security, bags. So there's a whole experience where we can really uh, innovate. And the innovation starts from the beginning, from the house. How do you start your journey? And they're thinking, IATA's thinking, which is the airline association, how do we make it easier for passengers to come out of the house or even before, before reserving or before buying a ticket, how can we uh, bring innovation uh, to that uh, experience? There's a lot of opportunities for innovation uh, in aviation. There's a lot of actually, a lot of fund as well. Uh, a lot of fund which was allocated to people who has ideas in, uh, uh, in aviation. IATA, airlines, they have each airline in uh, UAE have an innovation center and they are open for ideas outside. Uh, Tahad has an, a big innovation center and I visited, I was very impressed with that. Uh, we have an innovation center in, uh, in uh, the federal government and you know that, you know how the innovation is really driven by the, uh, by the government, by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, who has really emphasized this year and the years ahead on innovation and thus it's the only driver for economy for the UAE. So I thank you very much and uh, any questions?